Good morning. It is finally Friday. It's September 17th. So glad you are here. Dr. Steve Stites, of course, in the house. And today we are talking about something everyone in Kansas City can certainly come together on and support, and that is football. It is Football Friday, and as the Chiefs are following strict protocols to protect their players from COVID-19, we get kind of a unique perspective. We are joined today by former Kansas City Chiefs punter Dustin Colquitt with his take. Hey, how are you? He's going to talk about the impact of COVID and what it plays on and off the field and how this father of five, how he protected his family during this mm. pandemic, mm. father of five and a pandemic. That's a lot. Okay, so, but first, yeah. I want to talk about something else. We want to acknowledge a peaceful protest that started at 6 a.m. near 39th and Cambridge. It is expected to last until about 10 a.m. this morning. We truthfully don't really know a whole lot about the group that is expected, uh, but they are expected to oppose required COVID vaccinations here at the health system. When we learned of the planned protest, we found a safe space for them to picket for media so that they would not interfere with our patient care. So no worries if you are headed down here to the health system. It is business as usual and you will be able to access the hospital. So we just wanted to update you on that. Now let's get to the numbers with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Happy Friday. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. Happy Friday. Um, the acute active infections uh, have decreased. Uh, we have 33 active infections with 17 in the ICU and nine on the ventilator. And 39 in that recovery period, we should note that 30 uh, of those 33 active infections, only four are vaccinated. Unfortunately, we did have a death um, on the 16th as well. Um, and that patient was not vaccinated. We should say that also that Hayes continues to have steady numbers, eight active infections and seven that recovery period. And they did have a death over the last 24 hours as well. I believe we have a couple of reporters on the line. So go ahead with your question. Nope. All right. We do not have reporter questions. If we you must do, have just... answered them all yesterday. What's that? We answered them all yesterday. <laughs> did you answer all the questions? Did. Okay. No, COVID's done. All right. So we're going to get to your questions. I just lost a pom pom. Hate it when that happens. We're going to get to your uh, follow up Friday questions here in just a few minutes. But let's turn to this guy, former Chiefs putter Dustin Colquitt. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Thanks for having me in the studio. You rushed in just in the nick of time to join us. So happy you're here. And right. you're all scrubbed out. I Tell am. us a little I'm, bit about this. I'm You're scrubbed out. I'm in red. It's Red Friday, obviously. Uh, as a former Chiefs player, you got to wear your red on Friday if you live here in Kansas City. Um, uh, I'm excited to. <laughs> right, yeah, everybody's got red on. We've got the pom poms. It's uh, game day in two days, so um, we're excited about this. But we, during the pandemic, actually, we delivered some of these scrubs. We would go down to some local hospitals and kind of deliver and let people know, you know, what we're doing. It's the most comfortable scrub you can get, TI mm -hmm. scrubs. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Bill and Natalie Bush, who I did my Team Smile program, a lot of you guys know about. And so it's just fun doing this. We've done a lot of Chiefs players like Tyreek and Patrick. We have like those, if you want to personalize them, uh, it's a lot of fun to do that with the with the players mm -hmm. that we have. And, and uh, we're, we're trying to get them more into KU Hospital just to, to see if we can get some uh, you know, we have these doctors that are on the front lines doing all these things through, through the pro pandemic. And so we, we, hey, let's wear the scrubs too. Yeah, it's from fun. punter to scrubs model. Yes. I think you are rocking that position really well. I'm a cardiologist. It's Friday. Uh -huh. I'm wearing red. And <laughs> you I, you I got a heart right on your in. chest. You I got a heart. Like a heart doctor. How like exciting doctor. is it to have him here? We talk about Chiefs all the time. We always try to, we always try to fit the Chiefs we in do. somehow or we, sports we manage references. To. We manage to, and here we got him here right go. here. It's mm -hmm. good. What have you been up to, up to? What has it been like during this pandemic? It has been. You? It's been crazy. You know, I mean, especially you know, about third week in March last year, you're kind of going like, what is going on? The two, now two months or two two years into this thing, and we were like, everybody's stay at home order, right? And so you kind of get this sense of as information's coming in, you're trying to deal with it the best way you can. And I, I remember my, my now 13 year old, now 14 year old said, dad, I don't know how long I can do this. And I was like, buddy, this is not just our neighborhood. It's like worldwide. We're trying to figure out what's going on. And so it's best to stay at home and, and, and just be with each other. And we got to the point where we were staying at home so much. We, we, we had kids now going from all different rooms, all sleeping in one room. 
And I was like, this is awesome. So like, it brought is us this closer one of these together. camping right. trips you go on? Because yeah, I've heard you talk about your camping trips yes. before. Is that a camping yeah. trip? So it, it turned into a big camping trip. We should have pulled the RV up and just stayed right at the house. We didn't need any of the bedrooms. So this is your, your crew right that is here. My, that is my crew. Yeah, forget sports during a pandemic. I mean, being a father of five during a pandemic, I can't even imagine. I, mean, I just think that is a pandemic, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> right That's there. your own pandemic. Right De there. Definitely. Got well, it. Yeah. it was funny because uh, places like Sam's and Costco and stuff, if we didn't every like seven or eight days we weren't like ordering more food or you know going picking up and getting the deliveries they were like are you okay where are you and so right. we, we always laughed about that because you know our our job as as humans in this world at that time was hey stay at home that's the safest thing you can do spread out and so we just did it with our family and our neighborhood yeah. so there are two there are two pandemics they're dueling with each other there's COVID-19 <laughs> and then there's COVID-5 right. yeah, 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 yeah. exactly you have to recognize it absolutely right. good point okay so last time you were here um I ran upstairs to grab you because you were um being followed around by the media because you were up here doing what you, you love to do, which is come up to the hospital and see these kiddos and just spread some love. And everyone always loves it when you're in the, up on the units. And what's that like for you, just being up here and kind of get, I remember you kind of kneeled down with this one little guy and he was just, you guys were just eye to eye and um, really connecting. What's that, what's that like for you? Um, it's there awesome. he is. That's oh, a, remember yeah. that kid? Isn't so, he precious? And he was such a sweetheart. And, you know, Russell Stover is an, an awesome Kansas City based company. And you guys had a cool partnership with that, letting us come in, see, see this young young boy that's struggling with a lot of health issues, and seeing his family, making them smile. We got to go around to all the, mm. you know, give give bears, uh, give chocolates, and who doesn't make that? Sm I mean, it makes everybody smile. Bears chocolates chocolate. always good. That's and it. so that's it. Uh, it was fun interacting with him and just bringing joy to him, and got to see him play and just forget about you know what he's going through. Uh, right now and you know when I when I leave it's one of those things where you hop back in your car and you're like god I'm so glad you know all of our kids are healthy yeah. so um, it was fun hanging out here and you guys have done a great job like uplifting people um, in this community and people that come from all over the Midwest to come to your hospital for those reasons Love yeah, it. bears, chocolate, and footballs. We forgot. Those. Hello. So that's a, those exactly. are the trifecta. Right? That it is. Trifecta. It is. And if it's a chocolate football, yeah. then it's winning oh, recipe. Oh, really tough. Absolutely. I could talk to you all day about what you've been doing, and like I said, your family and and all sorts of good stuff you do in the the community. And we'll we'll talk more about that. But got to talk a little bit about football and just yes. how you think it's been impacted by this pandemic. The players, the game. Just what's your insight on that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's one of those things. Players are good with rolling with the punches. Uh, the the health administration, our trainers, the equipment staff, the coach it's one of those things like hey we're they're wanting us to play football we're an entertainment society we're going to do this the safest way we can i remember i was in pittsburgh at the time and we even took the team picture in masks because you're close and so it's one of those things that we're never probably going to see uh, a wide shot of teams with masks on because i think everybody did that yeah. it, it was my understanding i know in pittsburgh we did and and so when i was back in kansas city for the playoff run and to the super bowl same thing, you know, they had limited numbers in the uh, training room at the same time, limited numbers eating, limited numbers for all these things just to do everything we can. So I thought it was a cool way of seeing people deal with adversity um, and just making it work and working together and being responsible. It's not, we're not one of those things anymore where like, hey, I don't feel good, but I'm going to I'm going to push through and show up. It's like that thing. Now you have to say, hey, not feeling, I don't feel good. Like we got to, we got to nip it at the butt right there and so it was fun seeing people uh, do the right thing and, well and eyes are around. always on you so i right. mean you're you're leaders in so many ways whether you want to be or not and people are looking at you to do the right thing and they want to do what you're doing definitely and so when we were in new york i remember we, we opened the season in new york and you walk out and you're you're like you can hear like a, the camera guy in the stands for the first time it's new york biggest you know venue in the world uh, as far as like press and entertainment people queue in it's like you can hear everything. I can hear traffic outside. We pulled up to the opening gate and walked straight into that gate where normally you're down under the stadium, the ramps, in the locker room. So it was a very different feel all year long. And the vibe, though, that the crowd brings to the game, that's right. everything. Yeah, so right. to not have that would be so weird. It was pretty loud last weekend. There's a lot of vibe in Airhead last weekend. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> last awesome. year, you know, they're pumping in music like Seattle's done, you know, all this whole time, trying to be as loud as Arrowhead. Dr. Seitz, jump in with any questions you have for Dustin, but I have one about um, Tyron Matthews um, and just, again, the uh, the effects of COVID. I guess they've been um, keeping him in the loop by Zooming him. I mean, we've all jumped on these Zoom meetings. They, we all had to get used to it whether we liked it or not. But how does that 
that, is there a disconnect there? How does that affect a player when you're, I mean, you're supposed to be in the thick of it with your people and you're zooming in? Yeah, definitely, because you're, you're not getting as much in time answers to questions if you have like a defensive package coming up for Ty. And so I think that's one of those things where you're we're all watching film together. As they're going, you might have a guy come up and nudge from behind and say, hey, in this situation, I'm going to do this, that. you got to get to that later or, like, you know, after practice. And so it's one of those things where, like, oh, I wish you would have told me that. Well, we weren't sitting together. I wasn't in the room. So in Jacksonville when I was there, uh, the way we did it is we would check in early morning uh, via Zoom, and you'd go in and you'd do your meeting. And then it was like race over there, get on the field, shower and leave. Mm -hmm. And so you, you saw people like 10 guys at a time doing something and getting out of there. And so it was one of those things where I was only there for uh, two and a half weeks. But when you get into that building, you realize that these guys can't spend any time with each other. And so all the new guys, the veterans, it's okay because they know each other. But those new guys never got that, that time to you know go out and you know play golf together or go out to dinner together and and you know a lot of those organizations did really cool things where they they beefed up their kitchen and they would send you with tuesday wednesday thursday meals home you'd eat at the facility on friday and then so it was all new rules yeah you just adjusted mm -hmm. right so I think Kansas City just thinks of you. You're just Kansas City's punter. That'll, that'll just kind of be how it's always been. 15 years with the Chiefs. Have you ever seen anything or worked under any conditions like a pandemic? I mean, I can't imagine anything other than what you just explained. But what 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 would be considered similar to some weird experience like a pandemic? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I mean, it's one of those things that Kansas City, it's always been so open and family-oriented. And you feel like... When, when you start in training camp, even when we were in River Falls, we had hundreds and hundreds of people lining the fences just wanting to get to know you and thank you for being there and, you know, big lifelong Chiefs fan. And so I think that it, it's, it's, the, it's the exact opposite on the spectrum of what Kansas City has ever been used to. And so uh, the fans d dealt with it well. You could see any game they could too. It would you'd sneak in the parking lot, sleep, sneak in the game, and so that was fun to see. But I just don't see how you prep for it. Uh, I know that a lot of the NFL teams did it differently. I was in three or four different places that all of it, all of it was done differently. Mm -hmm. The protocols, I mean, same protocols, but different ways of like checking into meeting time and eating and doing stuff like that. So it was really cool how to see that. But I don't see how you could relate anything. This is just one of those one-time things that I really think that individual organizations, the NFL, and just all the healthcare providers nailed because it was one of those things like. We're just going to roll the punches and see how this works, but we're going to make it work. So you felt they did it right? I think they did. I think they did. In every place I was, I was very impressed that, you know, the things they had in motion to keep not only players safe, but, you know, PR departments for after the games, but trainers, staff, equipment managers, just all of that was done really well. They really had a pretty, they had, the NFL had a pretty successful season last year, and they're off to a good start this year. I mean, there's some stuff in one team that had six rate players positive recently, but I think overall, I think, I think things have gone well. The vaccination response to, by the players, pretty strong? Um, I, I think it depends. It depends one of those things where, you know, you hear in our culture, like, you know, my body, my choice, and some of these uh, sayings, and it's the individual they have to, a lot of, the, some of these players that, uh, that I've heard of and read about what they have going on is, you know, they might have like a allergic response to a vaccine or something that they have going on. It's not necessarily their anti-vaccine or pro-vaccine. It's just, it's their individual choice. And so it's hard to argue with that when, you know, I've, and during the pandemic, you know, obviously we stayed sheltered for the first like four or five, six months, but I have five kids and Disney opened up in July and I've been to Disneyland. I was, I was thinking about this other way during this pandemic. I was, I, I wore masks whenever necessary, but we went to Disney three times in Orlando. We had multiple cheerleading uh, things for Hartley, down, like or Orlando, Vegas, some of these places. I went on 17 to and from like flights things, and I'm so and, and never had any kind of problems. But it's also it, we're asking people to do something we've never done before, and you know, don't shake hands, mm -hmm. don't get too close. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, like, getting back and, like, hanging out with my wife in the same bed. We're still kind of – no, I'm kidding. We're, we're, yeah. that's, that's I, think, I think that would be overkill. But yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And with five kids, I don't think he could deny that one. Yeah, no, you're not sleeping control. alone ever yeah, with five happening. kids. Let me control. just tell you that. Um, so we've already got some uh, questions coming in from our viewers today. Doc Hawk, 
Yeah. Do you have any questions? Anybody? Are we good? We'll move on with some questions. Let's hit the questions. Dr. Colquitt yeah. here in just a moment. Okay, so we've got some questions for follow up Friday. So I want to get to those. I promised some folks that I would do that. So let me ask that. Um, do we know the percentage of people living with long hauler COVID symptoms? With living with long haul we symptoms, just, you know, they, it's between 25 and 50 percent uh, of patients get long haul syndrome, and that's that begins after three months uh, that from the time you've had COVID, uh, and it can last for a year, and sometimes it can last permanently. It really depends on how severely uh, injured. For example, if you have lung disease. Um, from COVID-19, a lot of that is really permanent. It is not going to get better. And, mm. and on the other hand, if you have fatigue and some of the brain fog, we hope that does get better. So a lot of it just depends on what type of long haul symptoms you might have. Yeah, I would agree. I think just like you stated in in um, in the reports and the articles, uh, anywhere from that range of those people have had um, long haul symptoms. And I think hopefully um, that number will decrease. Uh, because people are getting better and symptoms are getting resolved, whether that's naturally or some of our symptomatic treatments, or especially we've heard those stories about people who get vaccination and start to feel better as well. So I think in general what we have seen is that people uh, who are unvaccinated and who have gotten COVID, uh, that proportion tends to be 25 to 40 or 50 percent, depending on what studies you look at. Um, so we can land out about 30. And hopefully, and we have seen results now of very early studies showing that those who are vaccinated and get COVID, they have a 50 percent reduction in that chance or risk of getting long COVID and as some well. Some of these people have are sick for a long time. And again, some of it, again, the lung injury especially can be permanent. And unfortunately, um, uh, the only real therapy for that in the long run, if it's really severe, is, is oxygen, and you don't want it to wear oxygen at the time. So I would just, you know, once again, one of the cues to being vaccinated is not only to protect yourself and protect the ones you care about, but also help you to Hawk's Point to help avoid the long haul syndrome. What is the recommended timing for getting the vaccine after you've tested positive? Mm. Um, this person had a relative that had COVID and said that they now don't need the vaccine. Sadly, this came after they exposed my fully vaccinated father that ultimately led to his death. Mm. Mm. What do you think, Hawk? Yeah, so the official guidance and recommendation is that um, there is no minimum of time between getting infected and getting the vaccination. Typically what the guidance is, is that if you're infected, you need to be home isolating for those 10 days so you're not out spreading the disease. Um, so we really want you to wait that 10 days, but there is no minimum uh, time. Certainly, if you wanted to wait a few weeks, that is reasonable too, but it is recommended that you get the vaccine. Why? Because what we have seen, and, and better evidence is coming through every day, is that those who have gotten the illness and then got the vaccine seem to have better or more robust immune responses, both in the B cell, which makes the antibodies, and in the T cell response as well. Uh, we believe that you are now boosting those initial B cell and T cell responses that occur during the infection. And it also helps to further um, create more, more diversity in those B cell clones that make those antibodies so that you have better protection against number one, the variants that we know about and also the variants that we haven't yet identified. So you develop a wider breadth of immunity towards new uh, variants that may arise, and especially the variants that we already know about. I would say that the, the, the part of that question that's tough though, right, is the one about her father passed, yeah. who had been fully vaccinated. So when we have seen some deaths here from fully vaccinated patients. Now again, the overwhelming majority, over 95% of the deaths in the United States are in unvaccinated patients. But there are fully vaccinated people who are dying, and it, is, it tends to be those who probably didn't have as good an immune response to the vaccine, may not have mounted all those different forms of immunity that Hawkeye has mentioned. And for those folks, we would still say, if, you, if you've had an organ transplant, if you have advanced heart disease, if you have severe diabetes, if you have um, cancer and you're on chemotherapy, you probably need to continue to practice the rules of infection control, which keep you safe wherever you go. You mentioned those a little while ago, Dustin, but really it's, it's all about distancing, masking, washing your hands, and making sure you're staying safe while you wait out this pandemic. Also, while we study this question about boosters, you know, the FDA today is meeting, the FDA Advisory Committee is meeting today, Hawk, mm -hmm. on whether or not there will be a booster yeah. offered to the American public. And it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, there are some folks, including Dr. Dr. Fauci, who said, I think boosters are important. We see waning immunity after mm -hmm. six months, especially with the Pfizer vaccine and J&J. &J. So do, are there going to be different subsets of people? And will all boosters, be all vaccines be treated the same? I think that'll be a really important question we watch over the next few days. Um, we reference
reference yesterday some information coming out of the New England Journal of Medicine. They had a commentary. They were, they, they, they talked about uh, the Israeli data looking at booster effect. And I think what we're going to end mm -hmm. up seeing, my guess is, we're going to see that the waning immunity is especially important in those who are over 65 and have other advanced disease. But the, the general population who is otherwise healthy, I'm going to suspect that waning, that quote, waning immunity isn't really going to be relevant because they have enough immunity to really prevent severe infection from uh, the different uh, coronaviruses. Yeah, you know, I think we, we kind of do point to that Israeli data a little bit. Uh, but we also know we have data here, and we've referenced that as well. I think in Israel is looking today. Uh, they have about 650 patients, I believe, uh, or 650-something in that serious condition of those um, over 60 uh, who have received the booster. There's, they only have seven of those with severe illness. So the boosters do seem to work, but we have to understand, um, is this additional dosing going to be for everybody? I think we speculated if there is any recommendation for additional dosing, it will probably be in that older age group, whatever that might be, 16 above, 65 and above, or 70 above. We have seen our articles uh, from the United States experience in the uh, MMWR that was uh, posted last week as well that showed that those in that older age group uh, may have a higher risk of that severe disease. So. Um, we will wait and see uh, what the ACIP uh, committee is looking at today and what they ultimately recommend. But I believe they are also only looking at the Pfizer data at this point. I so think we'll that's also right. have to see They're that as well. About that. And to your point, although you did say older people again, I, I know. cautioned you about I, that since I, I try to be sensitive category. when you're here, but I don't know how to otherwise how be I sensitive. So okay. well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I throw out a range of ages. I'm going to include Jean Luc Picard because you know Jean Luc is also older and he's still a pretty cool guy. So I'm going to say, I'm with John Luke. There you go. Okay. Star Trek reference for the day. Go ahead. Okay. Jennifer has a question <laughs> for the doctors. Not talking about Ponmar, though. What? We're not talking about Ponmar today. We're not. We're not. <laughs> Don't go down that we rabbit hole. The Thank the Lord. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Jennifer has a question about masking in schools for our doctors, but I want to yes. ask you about just how your kids are handling um, masking. But Jennifer asked if the doctors would mind repeating their perspective on masking in schools, mm. specifically regarding its role in getting through this pandemic. Mm faster so the, the best way to close down a school or close down a classroom is not to be masked yeah. because especially in kids under 12 where there's no vac though they haven't been vaccinated and for those who are over 12 and oftentimes are between 12 and 16 with a Pfizer vaccine there is not a lot of folks who've been vaccinated so the best way to have trouble with school and make your kids go back to online learning is to not wear masks mm -hmm. the best way to keep your kids safe at school is to wear a mask the evidence is incontrovertible about that Dustin how What's it been like trying to keep masks on five kids? What's been, has there been challenges? What have you found? I, I think they've had to buy in. Um, it's my, my wife's actually a sixth grade um, math and religion teacher at St. Michael's mm -hmm. where all the kids get, well, all four, yeah. four of my kids go there and one is at Rockhurst. And so Rockhurst is all masks. Our school is up to parents' discretion. And so where that comes in is the, the play on words of the rules of if there is an exposure, if you're not masked, then you're sitting at home. And so exactly with, to your point, is right now we need to be in masks. We saw last year with just the seasonal, you know, cold flu mm -hmm. stuff, we had zero cases because the kids can't touch their face as much. They're not handling, you know, easily handleable things, uh, doorknobs, stuff such as that, going to the bathroom, whatnot. And so right now, I think that it's it, the numbers show that it's smart. We had like hardly any cases last year. This year, we're off to a really smooth start. They have little exposures here and here, but when you have a close contact and everybody in mass, mm -hmm. everybody everybody's unaffected. So well, and I think that's the key because if we don't do that, what we'll see is another surge like we had late last fall in November, December. Most folks think that was brought on by the reopening and people going into restaurants mm -hmm. and by the opening of schools and just the ripple effect from the transmission. And I think we don't want to see that again this fall. Yeah. And, you know, uh, to your point, Dustin, you know, Archbishop uh, Nauman had great deliberations and met multiple times for multiple hours, uh, getting people and experts from, from all walks, medical, but also spiritual, emotional, psychological, um, you know, created this letter and guidance for those uh, Catholic schools. We have seen some of the Catholic schools uh, or some of these private schools did not follow masking. We know that they had to be quarantined or shut down for a couple weeks, but there were some that did. So there's good anecdotal evidence in our community about that. And it's not only the private schools, it's public schools as well. We have all seen the stories that have come out since school started. But we know there's also very good uh, evidence that is published uh, nationwide, particularly in uh, morbidity, mortality. We 
weekly report. I had to actually answer this question twice today on emails from other people uh, around the states here um, and had to give some references. But the references are out there. Please, everybody, go to the CDC, look at uh, their guidance for schools, go to the American Academy of Pediatrics. This information is out there. There is a good uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report that showed that uh, masking and ventilation in those school situations did reduce incidence by 30 to 40 percent of the of um, of spread of the disease but I also want everybody to remember it's it's not the question of the masks work the masks don't work what we have seen is the overwhelming uh, majority of the uh, peer-reviewed science shows that in those high-risk situations masking is favorable for reducing the spread of disease and what are those high-risk situations being indoors large gatherings um, we know that those reduce the risk of spread of disease. Uh, it's not just an absolute. So I think we need to get away from the absolute. The mass works, the mass does not work, but it's that continuum. And we know that in those high risk situations, masking along with other things that can be implemented, those non-pharmaceutical interventions, distancing, good ventilation, those all help to reduce the spread of disease in those situations. And so I think that's what we really need to focus on rather than the question, the, does the mask work or does it not work? It is that continuum. Um, and if people continue to be thoughtful in what they do and do have masking and when in those situations where they can have distancing for what the uh, that school or institution allows as far as the engineering goes and good ventilation and of course vaccination, you will see that reduction uh, in spread of disease in that school um, and ultimately keep school going so that the kids are not home isolated doing online learning. I'm still thinking about your wife. She, you know, just these teachers to me are complete saints and mm. they are frontline workers and they are superheroes. So please tell, I mean, just keeping kids safe at school. I, I think that the schools have done such an amazing job and then doing it at home as well. It's a lot of work. So yeah. um, Sally has a question, which I think you've answered. It was, what does Dustin think about the vaccine and masks, which I think you've talked about, but how are you navigating just the topic, the social topic of vaccines and masking. I'm sure people ask you that a lot, just what are your thoughts about things and, and how are you approaching that when people want to know your opinions on things like that? Yeah, definitely. And, and usually that's in text chains and circles. Mm -hmm. And like when you see somebody out of ball fields, a lot of the activities that we do, like right now, the res most responsible way that we can do when we're shopping for this many kids and, and food is the biggest grocery, like grocery bills are huge for everybody. And so we're, we're trying to get our uh, groceries delivered right now to stay out of the store, stay away from, you know, people that we're not like doing this kind of going through the pandemic with, you know, on a daily basis. And so we've tried to cut that down as far as vaccines. That's, that's people's choices. But what I would say, if you're not going to take a vaccine, if like you're anti-vaccine pro, whatever, whatever you're doing is you don't have to shake hands and the hugs and we have to figure this thing out right now. And so we have, we're, we're trying to watch it for the long haul with new variants coming in you know, I always question too, this is a little off topic with the same thing. We're talking about being careful with new variants coming out. And then we have a border issue where people are flooding our border right now. And so we have to be careful with that, right? I mean, that's a worldwide yeah, they, thing. Well, I think the, the problem is that there's so much transmission in, uh, worldwide, right? And so many countries are unvaccinated and whether it's a border or not a border, the vaccine, the virus doesn't care what border you have. It doesn't care if you're a red state, blue state, Missouri, Kansas. It, it's right. just, it's going to spread. And I think that the most effective therapy that, that is clear is vaccination. We have a mandatory vaccination policy here. Um, we have some protesters out there today about that. And that, that's, a, that's a great American art form. The right to protest is a great American art form. Right. But at the end of the day, what we know is that if there are people who are going from place to place to run those protests. So we had about 30 people out there, about seven or eight were our staff and the rest were these folks who had kind of organized the protests around. Um, again, that's an art form. Um, and, and it's a peculiar American art form and a great American art form. It's part of democracy. But it's also true we have to keep each other safe. Exactly. For example, if you're gonna go into a restaurant, the people in the restaurant can't say, well, I'm gonna cook the chicken at 100 degrees instead of 160 degrees because that's my choice. Right? You can't say that because that's going to produce an unhealthy food because it's going to make you sick. So at some point, we all have to remember that we have the freedom of choice, but we have freedom with responsibility. Exactly. You, can't, you can't decide, I'm going to drive my car into somebody because I want to. You can't run a red light because you say, I, I, don't want, I, I have a choice. I don't want to run this road. I don't want to watch this red light. Screw it and go into the red light and hit somebody. 
You see, th there are rules in society, and those rules are meant to do the public good and promote the general welfare and provide for the common defense and to promote the blessings of liberty. You really aren't free when people can do anything they damn well please. That's actually not freedom, right? That, 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 that's anarchy. And I think what we have to recognize is there's a difference and that when we work to keep each other safe, when we do that right thing, um, then, then I think, we're, I think that, that's, that is what a real democracy is like. If you step back and you can say, well, people do have the right to their own body to make a choice about vaccination. And in this country, that's true. In this health system, we've said we have a vaccine requirement. And I think we stand behind that because we know we're taking care of people every day. And we know that vaccination helps keep our staff safe. It helps keep our patients safe. You know, we had this impassioned uh, plea about uh, one of my patients sent me a note maybe three weeks ago. And uh, they're a cancer patient. And they come here and they get cancer therapy. And they have to get um, chemotherapy and to go down to our infusion center to do that. And that patient, we had, did not have a vaccine requirement at that point. That patient said to me, how can you not have a requirement? Because we all know that vaccination reduces the risk of spread. So why am I, as a chemotherapy patient, coming to your cancer patient, laying in a bed, having someone take care of me for three hours while I get my infusion, and I don't know if they're vaccinated or not? Because, you know, that, 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 what's the right thing for that patient? And, 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 and you know, I think that is it. That's a fair question. So, you know, we have a vaccine requirement now. We waited until Pfizer came out and said, we're going to have a vaccine. We, we have a fully FDA-approved drug. We make sure that people wear masks, which we know remarkably reduces the risk of spread. And to Hawkeye's earlier point, um, it, 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 it is a really strong way of doing it. And we know that we don't spread COVID-19 inside our hospital because people are masked. Because we didn't, we didn't spread it before. We, 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 we had vaccination. So what we're trying to do inside hospitals is keep folks, folks safe. We have a vaccine requirement that helps make sure you stay safe and that our staff stay safe and that we can then take care of people when they get sick. And I think you know, that, that's the mission of healthcare. And uh, you know we all want to keep Patrick and all the chiefs safe. And, and so we, we urge people to go out and get a vaccination to help keep our society safe and make sure that we can stay strong and healthy. I love everything you just said. That was a good. That was a good one. This is my riff for the morning. That was your good riff. You didn't I love give it. me a riff earlier. I got a riff. I didn't. You I'm gonna work. I'm working my riffs in. That's you will get I'm it working. in. I get all, and it's a Friday. <laughs> You're a little spicy today. Okay, so Isaac has a question. <laughs> I can start singing. I'm dreaming of a no sing. Smiles. Well, you yeah. may sing later. I might let you sing later. Um, okay, so Isaac has a question for our guest, Dustin. What do you think of the stadium being full again from a COVID safety perspective? I know just because you played at Chiefs Stadium, you don't have or Arrowhead doesn't mean you have all the answers. I get that. But um, he says that he uh, doesn't think there's been as bad of effect lately, but and he, he doesn't mind watching on TV, but he's still a little nervous of going out to the stadium. Just when, when you see a full stadium, what do you think? I mean, it's nice to see. But what do you think? It's, it's different from the last year that we've experienced, especially last football season. So I think people are trying to get used to seeing that that fandom. But <laughs> talked about it. For, and plus, you know, if you talk about something, and then the anticipation builds, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we have a full stadium again. This is fun. Like I've been looking forward to this. But yeah, I mean, like like you said, if you don't feel comfortable, wear a mask. Um, right now, the TVs are amazing. Right now, stay in your living room if you have the barbecue and beer you want, some Boulevard or whatnot. Then, and then do that. But yeah, I mean, right now we have to be practicing that. What, <clears throat> what's what we're doing at St. Michael's is all you know. Most all kids are in masks. They are spreading them out, and so we're, we're doubling down on all of our safety procedures. So. Well, you know, we know the Royal Stadium has been pretty safe. We know Lollap we've talked about the Lollapalooza, 385,000 people. They didn't see a spike. They were all vaccinated with it to show their vaccine re, uh, to get in. We don't do that at, at Arrowhead. Um, some stadiums have elected to do that, and we'll see how that goes. But I think the, I know the Kansas City Public Health Department will be watching really closely uh, the data that comes out from uh, exposures at Arrowhead. But what I would say is that, you know, I, I was there last week. I, I love the Chiefs, and everybody knows that. I talk about them all the time, the Chiefs, Royals, sporting. But um, went to the game, wore my mask when I was in the concourses, wearing it because there's so many crowds and people moving around so darn much. And then I sat down to the stadium. I'm outside, and I uh, felt pretty good. Took my mask off. And then when I go back inside the stadium, I put my mask back on, and and um, I, I and I'm fully vaccinated, so I felt pretty good about that. And and we'll we'll see how the data goes. 
But yeah, I've been going to Chiefs games for approximately a very long time because I'm approximately very old. So back in the 70s when we were terrible in December, it was 17 degrees, and there may have been 17 people in the stadium, and I would be there. My neighborhood uh, up the street would offer me a ticket. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Holliger. And um, uh, I would go there to those games, and it was, it was those were not the best of days, and it was a little quieter. Now you go to Arrowhead, and, and the place is rocking. That that was great. And uh, I remember the first game when we were under the Schottenheimer era, and we were really starting to come back, and we played Monday Night Football. And that place, I, I, I tell you, that was so much fun because it was like, oh, my God, we came, we're back. You know, the Chiefs are good again. Mm, and sure. uh, that, that was a lot of fun. There's some great memories that come out of Arrowhead Stadium, but no memories like the ones today. It's a great place. Yeah. I mean, listening to you, I think with your age, you may need three boosters. I probably do. <laughs> I probably need a lot of boosters. Yeah. Actually, I'm a little hyper. I probably don't need any boosters. <laughs> Ring it down. A shot of something. You need a shot yeah, of something. It's, uh, I may need a shot. That'll be later today. That'll be later. Okay, so um, one of our follow-up um, Friday questions I wanted to ask you, how, how many people hospitalized with COVID are smokers? Yes, that, that, I saw that question. I don't know. That's a great question. Do, and does much? smoking enhance or so affect your chance of <laughs> Well, what we know is that people who have underlying lung disease yeah. like asthma and emphysema clearly don't do as well. Early in the pandemic, we thought asthma ah, may not be so bad, but later on, we thought, oh, you know, asthma is bad. Emphysema, COPD, bad things. So I'm going to say by um, in, in interpretation then or by, by um, insinuation that, that smoking is a bad thing. But I don't know. I'm not, I, I, Hawk, have you seen data about smoking specifically? No, but I think to your point, which, you know, you have uh, talked about quite a few times, it's the effect of the lungs yeah. and the smoking. But we also know that prior to the pandemic, if you were smoking, um, your surgeons were really requesting you to stop because we know the overall ill effects of smoking on your body. And so that was just a general thing, uh, whether it's for just medicine or for surgery's uh, uh, point of view, we know that smoking affects your ability overall to heal and recover. Okay, Cheryl wants to know, she says, my 26-year-old daughter has recently recovered from COVID. She had monoclonal antibodies and she was not vaccinated. She mm. has recently been now diagnosed with heart inflammation due to COVID. Is mm. this something we should be concerned with? Will it just go away on its own? She is scheduled uh, for an appointment with a cardiologist next week, but she just wants to know in advance. Yeah, absolutely. We know the heart inflammation, um, probably the myocarditis in, in this, or perimyocarditis also. Um, we know that this can happen with a lot of different viruses. We know that those who are unvaccinated and do get COVID-19, however, are at increased risk compared to those that are vaccinated. So certainly, um, but in general, the myocarditis or that heart inflammation for the most part will resolve and there won't be any ill effects. I think it is important that you continue to see your cardiologist to monitor that status. And again, I would also then recommend when you can to get that at least first dose of vaccine and then when it's time get that second dose because that will number one, help prevent myocarditis in the future and it will also help increase the breadth of your immune response should you see COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 again or any other new variants that may start to circulate. Okay, last question um, is one of our follow-up questions from the week, and we've gotten several of these doctor sites, but could you explain why every COVID patient um, does not receive monoclonal antibodies? Why don't we just give that to everyone who tests positive and is feeling sick? Yeah, so let's go through that. So um, there's a couple of reasons. So first, monoclonal antibody therapies have been studied extensively in different situations regarding COVID-19. So in hospitals, it, they don't appear to be that effective. Now there's some new information out that suggests there are, if you get them early in the hospitalization, you might have some positive mm -hmm. effects. But overall, in, in hospital COVID-19 use with the antibodies, um, not that effective and maybe not worth the side effects. So on the other hand, if you get them in the right, the, patient population on the outpatient side with that and people who are high risk that is likely to not do well, then they clearly do reduce hospitalizations by up to 80%. So in certain populations, they work really well. In certain populations, they do not. And Hawk, we actually have pretty strict criteria for who's yeah. going to get those monoclonals. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point there. Uh, they are very effective. at For those that are high risk of going to the hospital and severe disease, they are extremely effective at reducing that risk. And we have seen that our numbers here are really in line with the trial data. And we've protected probably, I think, 95% of our people that have gotten uh, COVID monoclonal antibodies uh, from going to the hospital. So that's right in line with the, uh, the trial data. I would certainly agree with you. Uh, 
it is uh, extremely helpful and significant benefit, but there are some strict criteria. We want those with the highest risk of hospitalization to be getting those. Um, the other thing is we still are trying and waiting for the inpatient use, as you mentioned, Steve. Uh, there Currently, there is no uh, emergency authorization for the inpatient use, but there is probably that small select group of people who may uh, benefit from that in the hospital. But again, at that point, you have to test for antibodies to make sure that they're antibody negative, uh, but there could be a benefit there, and we are just still waiting for any uh, emergency use authorization from the FDA for the inpatient use. All right, we're gonna get our final thoughts. I just have to and, say. Sorry, Go let ahead. me interrupt you one yeah, time. Yeah, please do. I think the question before uh, the woman and her daughter, uh, we should also note that if you do receive monoclonal antibody treatment, you should wait 90 days prior, uh, or 90 days before you get vaccinated uh, against COVID. You know, I like to brag and embarrass you, Dr. Seitz, but um, <laughs> Georgie Ann says that Dr. Seitz is amazing, keeping calm every day. You're kind of a little, like I said, is this you being calm? This this is you're my, just so this chill. Is, this is my chill, calm day. I'm not this way at Arrowhead. Um, I'm not this way at home sometimes. My kids would testify to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but some, some days, I, most days, I, I try to be calm until I get pithy. Yeah, this is know. kind of you. Very chill. Okay, Dustin, this was so fun to have you here. Are you coming back? Come Absolutely. Back and, come back and hang with us. I get to be a doctor for a day. Absolutely. We get those cool shirts. We want the cool shirts. <laughs> the cool yes. shirts. Yeah. We can do that. We love that. Okay, sit in with us anytime. Um, but I'd like to get some final thoughts from you today, just as you head out on this weekend. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're the first road trip, so business trip, as Andy Reid would say. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just be safe, be responsible as you're out and about and making Kansas City what it is, which is a, a great Midwestern place to live. And, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for sharing your message with us. We really appreciate it. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts from you today. Yeah, everybody continue to get vaccinated. We will keep you updated. Uh, we know that ASIP is meeting today for recommendations on if additional dosing with Pfizer is going to be needed and when and for who. And so once we have that information, which I expect some of it, but we'll have a press release later uh, later today, we'll certainly be willing to and be able to talk about it on Monday. All right, calm, cool states. Yeah, I don't know about calm and cool. You know, I could sing about I'm dreaming of a red Christmas and another Super Bowl, or I could talk about the rules of infection control. Now, the former is more interesting, but the <laughs> latter may be more relevant because we can keep Patrick, Dustin, and every other chief safe if we all follow these things together. Remember that no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you can stay safe and you can keep all your loved ones safe too. That's it? Uh, that was a rhyme. <laughs> I like it. Not bad. Remember to wear your mask, keep your distance, don't go out if you're sick, wash your hands, and go get vaccinated. Because at the end of the day, even though there's still no place like home, there are some other fun places on the earth. And the way we can get there is if we get there together. Let's keep each other safe. Let's get vaccinated. Let's do it. All right. Thank you all for being with us today on Monday. People, of course, always ask, how well do masks work? We've seen you guys really, really well. Really well. We've seen you really in the freezer. Well. We're going to resurrect that video. Yeah. But we're going to find out. Two area researchers dive deeper into the results of their recent JAMA study focusing on how Kansas mask mandates impacted COVID hospitalization and death rates. So we'll talk more about that. Everyone have a great weekend. Go Chiefs. We'll see you back here at 8 o'clock on Monday. Live long and prosper. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.